Welcome to The Bunk, your source of fact-checking information from the mainstream media to your honest Facebook ramblings. I am James, and I had a packed show ready for you all today, which I spent many hours pulling my hair out for researching, but after struggling... Literally, he's bald. Sorry? He's bald. You're bald. You I'm bald your hair now, out. yes. But after struggling to find a way to fit all the information into an hour, learning that everything I knew was wrong, which prompted me to say something that I instantly regretted, and that was even before I tried to find some impartial guest to report on it, I decided to drop it, like two days ago. So I put a distress call out, and who should answer it but the legendary Jake Farr Warden of the L Friends podcast. Uh, that's the I Friends podcast, actually. I Friends, I should have used the lowercase I, I'm sorry. Yeah, should have used the lowercase, yep. Uh, it's, it's, it's the autopilot Consumate thing. Consummate issue, yep. Yeah, I totally understand, I totally get it. Also, you mispronounced my surname. Oh, really? Yeah, it's it's Jake Firewarden. I'm I'm Firewarden. Uh, I'm the yep. The Firewarden fire, of the area fire that you warden. live in. They have a lot of fires yep. up that way. Yeah, we do. So I'm the Firewarden. I just walk around going, "We all, we all." It's great fun. <laughs> it's also a great workout for my voice. Uh, it's really great. Uh, develops great melodic tune. Mm. Yeah, it's good good for singing and good for yelling at at people and. Yes, but look, neither of us do any of that. No. Well, I try to sing. Can't say I can, but yeah. And I try to yell at people. Huh? Well, we both need to work on that. So, as I said, this show pretty much doesn't have a main story this week. Uh, So, we're just going to do sort of an extended version of a segment that I do at the start of the show called Hold the Onion, where you try and work out, I give you a story, and you try and work out if it's true, false, or satire, which would be Onion. Oh, that's the best. Love it. Okay, and first thing off the rank, the censorship policy. Swear away, good sir. Um, So, the uncensored version will be available to patrons. The censored version will be available for free. Uh, but anything that cannot be cited when I do the write-ups will be cut out entirely. Oh, I love it. That's a really good policy. Also, I don't swear. Yes, I, well, I thought that from, from the uh, iFriend show, but I didn't know if you just cut it all out like you do to <laughs> everyone else. Not saying, mentioning any names. Uh, no, it's it, my uh, my ethos is so you know. Look, I, I have a I have a uh, good job. Uh, I have a great job actually in in a great place, um, and I don't want to say anything that might reflect poorly on my uh, employers. So I tend to be you know pretty level headed. I have a very similar policy around um, uh, around uh, things that can't be fact checked, or at least uh, at the very least, I always come back and uh, do that. But uh, yeah, I tend not to say things that are too controversial. Right. Um, and uh, try, try, try not to try. swear. Because I do know, I do know that I have people um, that <laughs> that I work with that listen to my show. So I, I try not to give them things that uh, they might blush at when they see me next. Or, or worse still, worse still, bring up uh, at the beginning of a meeting. Hey, Jake, I heard you on that show the other week when you said that X and Y are also blue waffle syndrome. I don't. I don't want that to happen. Don't you know mention, what I mean. Don't mention that was clear? the novel. Yep. Yep. That's clear. <laughs> uh, look, if if uh, if they want to hear any of that sort of stuff, they'll have to pay for it. So. Yeah. Good. I have to pay for it. I'll swear. I'll swear for the paying customers. If you have any Jake's co-workers are listening, pay me money and I'll give you dirt. <laughs> oh, that's a threat that may actually come back to bite me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's start with the uh, first human head transplant. So this report has uh, been going around, actually, saying that the first human head transplant... Oh, look, they've already spoiled it for me. Well, just read the, just read the title. Don't read the, the article, because most people don't even read the articles. They just read the, the, the headline. So the world's first human head transplant has been car- successfully carried out. I'll just cancel. Uh, true, false, or satire? I'm going to say it's uh, it's false because while it is true that it actually happened uh, and while it is true that they've called it successful, um, the person's still dead. Caveat, the person was dead before they started. Well, both the people <laughs> were dead before it started and they both yep. are still dead. Yep. But but the actual transplant itself, oh my god, major success. We can now we can now safely we can now safely remove the head of an individual and put it on the body of another individual. But spoiler alert, both of them have to be dead and will stay dead. So <laughs> it's pretty well a useless procedure. 
Well, actually not. Uh, so the, the whole point of the procedure was to test out a new adhesive. Oh, okay. Which, uh, right. which apparently encourages nerve growth and basically so that if they were to attempt this on a live person, that person would stay alive, hopefully. Wow. But how – no, come on. Because, no, you got you got to cl- – so, wait, when you saw the head off, like how long is that going to take? I suppose you could do that without rupturing the major blood vessels to the brain and then do that last or clamp them off and then and then sever them. But then when you go over to the other one, how long is that going to take to – like, how, oh, you'd have to put them on some form of dialysis. I suppose you could do it, actually. I take everything that I said back. <laughs> Yeah, I think there's ways that you could preserve, probably um, in some kind of slightly cryogenic state. Yeah, bypass machines. I suppose we do that for hearts right now, don't we? We we take out, you know, for heart transplant or even for just uh, for for bypasses. We we you know, one valve is faulty. We clamp off the uh, the internal uh, mechanisms. Uh, we uh, you know uh, uh, attach that um, that. Uh, the 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 blood vessel to a um, the the bypass machine that thing feeds it around and sends it around the body while you're working on the the on the the heart valve and then you put the new valve in and you shake it all about and then you'd reconnect it and uh, all of a sudden um, the 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 heart's back to functioning again so I suppose you maybe could use some form of bypass but it's like oh man that is that is some next level stuff that's that's incredible they have okay they have done it on uh animals before but they they tend to die not during the operation they die after the operation because of rejection issues i th- the record was a rhesus monkey i mean this is going back to the 1950s i believe 1956 if i'm not mistaken i won't censor that if it's not right i'll just issue a link in the show notes so um, but yeah, rhesus monkey, it only lived for a few days, but yeah. they did well, manage to transfer a live head to another live body, but you know, um, wow. if, if that's the, crazy, if the head rejects the body, you're pretty much done for. Well, I'll tell you what, no head attached to my body would reject it. Uh, cause I've got a pretty sweet body. You're like, uh, no, no head. I'm not rejecting you. Uh, you'll have to reject me. Or something. Imagine, imagine if you know someone like you who goes actually takes care of their body. You know, is in an accident, and then you you wake up and they're like, "Oh, sorry, the only donor body we could find was Pat Robertson." Wow. Yeah. Well, you know, um, as I said uh, recently, you can't spell necromancy without romancy. So <laughs> I'll just throw myself a new new body that I can love. Um, <laughs> Yeah, look, I, I I was actually um, this is one of those things, but you know, I have been secretly wishing and hoping and praying and investing um, appropriately to uh, enable uh, future, uh, you know, f- for me in the future, say, you know, eighty years down the track when uh, I'm starting to show the the signs of age, you know, little crow's feet developing around my eyes. Um, that's uh, that's that you know that is the appropriate time I think when I would take my brain from my head and. Put Put it inside a um, you know cybernetic organism mm. uh, in order to you know essentially uh, support surpass the uh, the limitations of aging um, within a biological organism. But you know, look, I think that type of head transplant that 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 is what I'm truly wait, you know waiting for. That you know when I can truly have immortality for the future. Right. This yep. boring glue one. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, there's always the I mean, I, I just just stick me in a computer, stick my transfer my consciousness into a computer, so I can sit and observe what happens next. Where does humanity go? How long does it last for? Yeah, yeah, but then you've got the issue of uh, of uh, you know spam and um, you know the pop ups, the infinite pop ups, and like, has your brain been transplanted into the conscious, or has your consciousness been transplanted into an Apple, uh, into a Mac, or, or into a PC, or, or worse, a Linux system, or worse still, um, whatever that other crazy um, niche one that uh, that that programmers use that has Ubuntu. What is it? Uh, maybe that is Linux. It anyway, is. yes. All right, we're getting away from facts, so we go to the next story. <laughs> Okay, so this hu- apparently this uh, 
human cat creature has been found in Malaysia. Malaysia, the place for facts. Wow! Yeah, it's kind of creepy looking. Yeah, it is definitely creepy looking, but it also doesn't even slightly look real. I mean, it looks real, but it looks like something that... Um, uh, what's the name of the guy who created the uh, the xenomorphs from uh, the Aliens movies? Um, oh, it looks like remember. something that he would create. Or Cronenberg. Or was that Cronenberg? Yeah, Cronenberg, yeah. Or did he do the no, xenomorphs? No, it wasn't Cronenberg. I don't know. <laughs> this, yeah, this look, is it going has, off the rails has, very quickly. Wow, that's it's really interesting because it has it has defined movement of various extremities. I your um, the the arms look like they would move in relatively uh, you know standard um, uh, linear ways. The the neck like the the neck didn't flop backwards. The neck looks like it's supported by some form of spine. Uh, it's a really interesting case, uh, but I've got to say, probably fake. Yeah, I actually thought this one was was real. Uh, I mean, not alive. It it looks like the kind of thing that you see. You know, this cow was born in India and died two days later. Um, but yeah, it's it's fake. It's actually uh, it's a creature. This this woman uh, does. Oh, I should have actually. Um, I've got her Facebook here, but I should have pulled up her Etsy page. She sells these things on Etsy. I think that one was like $350. Oh, my gosh. They're so creepy. There we go. Um, and, yeah, but some of them are – there's an eye eye there. Actually, the eye eye doesn't look that realistic. She's got a um, sphinx cat. But isn't isn't the eye eye a real cr- creature? That's that. That's that uh, the eye eye, yeah. That's – yeah, it's one of the one of the creatures that uh, was featured in um, Douglas Adam uh, Douglas Adams's uh, Last Chance to See, which was then revisited by uh, Stephen Fry with Mark that's Cowardine, it. the photographer who did the, the original, original series. Yep. Wow, that's creepy. It's so creepy. Mm. But yeah, she sells these things, and I see, and some of them are really good looking. But they they are quite expensive. They're made of silicon. Um, I don't know how she gets them to move like that. Maybe they do have some kind of skeletal structure, but uh, yeah, she does a pretty good job on them. Wow, gross. Okay. Oh, this goes back to what we were saying before. Uh, Swearing is a sign of intelligence, not less, say scientists. (laughs) There's a lovely middle finger on the top there. I actually got this. I couldn't find the the original link, but uh, there's been a few memes going around saying that people who swear at work are smarter and probably a couple of BuzzFeed videos or something. But um, yes, what what do you think of of this scientist say that swearing is a sign of more intelligence? Uh, Look, I'm going to say that it's probably uh, correct, Uh, you know, true. Uh, But um, look, I... (laughs) The, the 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 first sentence of uh, of this story reads uh, to use obscene or taboo language or swearing as it's uh, more commonly known is often seen as a sign that the speaker lacks vocabulary and 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 that that has always been the claim that I maintain um, that uh, you know look there are so many great words that you could use instead of you know one of the uh, you know four letter or five letter words um, that uh, you know that it just shows that you're not using your uh, you're not using your 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 vocabulary to the best of your ability. Um, so while true, um, I think it's I think it's uh, you know a silly thing to study. I don't know how to call that now. Um, actually, no. I'll just I'll, I will call it um, partially false, and you're wrong. Wow. Go on. <laughs> okay, so um, I, I tracked down the original study. So what the original, what the study which they're quoting, so remembering that the headline and all the articles are saying that swearing is a sign of more intelligence, not less. So the article actually debunked the claim that swearing is a sign of less intelligence. Uh, but what they did was they compared uh, – Swearing vocabulary level. So, how many swear words do you know? So, the people who knew more swear oh. words tended to have more general vocabulary, which was linked to intelligence. So, you could you could look at someone and say, "How many swear words do you know?" And the more swear words they know, 
was generally a good indicator that they were more intelligent, but only because that generally applied to their wider vocabulary level. That makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. So simply saying that someone swears more so they're more intelligent, that isn't true. It's just... It's just if they swear in all of the swear words, then you know they're more intelligent. Yeah, if they only know two or three swear words and they know them quite liberally, and then the, sorry, and they use them quite liberally, you could probably say, yeah, uh, you know, learn some, learn some more swear words. Here's some more four-letter words for you to practice. Yeah, there was actually there was a really great um, uh, fiction um, book by uh, author Brent Weeks. Um, the sh- I can't. It, it was the Shadow series. I can't remember um, the the uh, the names of each of the books, but um, uh, <laughs> there was a uh, a monarch in the book who only knew one word and variations thereupon. So uh, you know he would say strings of words like you. Sh- <laughs> uh, instead of instead of something more verbose, and uh, it was an interesting way um, to you know demonstrate the kid. The, the guy was just a, an absolute loser of a man who could barely string together two swear words. But I think I, I kind of wonder though if um, that could be a sign of of more intelligence because clearly that person suffers from some kind of neurological disorder. Uh, so if they were able to effectively communicate using only two or three words, then it might actually be a sign of uh, versatility or uh, – oh, God, what's the word I'm looking for? See, my vocabulary, I'm not obviously not very intelligent. <laughs> I can't what think of the word. a great way to punctuate this story. Resourcefulness. <laughs> oh, I love it. Ah. Okay, um, so I've seen this one around Facebook. This was actually uh, from a source which was featured last week, and that was uh, false. But this week we have what the F asterisk CK facts says, Al Al, Israel's national airline, is the only commercial airline to equip its planes with a missile defense system. I'm going to say false because most aeroplanes, regardless of whether they're commercial airliners or anything else, will have flares in them. Um, I uh, well, that's an assumption that I'm making, obviously. <laughs> um, but presumably, presumably, surely m- most planes must have some form of defence against against you know civilian uh, potentially civilian. Uh, heavy arms, presumably. I've got to say they must. They have to. Uh, not until recently, actually. So the yeah. um, when the 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 system was introduced, um, I believe back in two thousand three, um, there was some controversy. The FAA wouldn't actually approve it because they were concerned that uh, if the flares were accidentally dropped at a low level that they could cause damage to airfields or people's houses. Basically, they're just worried about dropping flares. Because have you ever seen a, a um, spoof system in operation? Well, only in, uh, only in games. Yeah, well, uh, if, you, if you look up a video of them, uh, they, they spew out tons and tons of these flares out the back of them. Yeah. It's not just dropping one flare that the missile goes no. from. It's a whole barrage of fire. And the, yeah, the reason um, for that is many of the missiles they're trying to defend from are uh, heat-seeking, uh, heat-seeking missiles. And uh, in order to distract the uh, the you know AI within the um, within the missiles, they've got to create a heck of a lot of uh, a heck of a lot of heat, you know, enough to distract from the exhaust system of the plane itself, right? Yep, yep. So basically, the US wouldn't allow this, wouldn't allow commercial airlines with flares to fly in their airspace. Um, and Switzerland as well had a, a problem with it. But uh, so recently, they've converted to using laser systems to dazzle and blind the missiles. Um, I couldn't actually find authority sources on whether they've been approved by the FAA or not. Well, the, F- the FAA approved them. And the United States were looking at implementing them in commercial airlines, but there was an issue there with um, they couldn't verify their reliability. So I've had a lot of trouble finding confirmation as to whether or not these are now being implemented in commercial airlines in the United States. But it looks like no. The, I, I found that there's actually the, the flyer 
for the system um, from Northrop Grumman, I found that, and basically it only refers to the trials done by the D- Department of Homeland Security, which is not commercial airlines. Hmm. So I can't really call this one, but I'd say it's most likely true, um, only because... They they were early adopters of the system. They were the only country that actually had a system that used flares, and now they've upgraded to laser systems so that they're a bit more acceptable in other countries. But I couldn't find any information on any, any other airlines currently using the um, any kind of missile defense system. Wow. Wow, that's really interesting. I would have thought that they all had them. Now I don't feel like flying anymore. <laughs> Well, see what happens with these uh, laser systems, whether or not they, they are adopted more widely. But um, they were they were approved by the FAA in 2008, but then this, um, apparently this, the trials were put on hold because there were some issues, some political issues. So, But how do they power them? Like presumably, like any, any sort of laser uh, requires a you know, a crap ton of uh, power in order to, uh, you know, focus light to such a uh, intensity that would, you know, um, do anything, let alone melt the melt the uh, plastic and metal um, that uh, is covering the, uh, the, the insides of a, um, you know, the fragile insides of a missile. Like, where are they putting all the power? Well, you only have to overwhelm the CCD. If you point a burning laser at a camera, that camera is not going to work anymore. Uh, and they also apparently use some kind of modulation system that causes that actually causes the electronics, the computers, the guidance systems to bug out. So they're not only blinding the CCDs, but they're also causing errors in the system. Wow. So they're quite wow. quite sophisticated. But what about what about less sophisticated missiles though, like the point and shoot? Like the ones that uh, that are you know like a bazooka type thing oh. that aren't technically missiles, but technically also are. Well, no- nothing's going to stop though, because if if they're not guided, then you're not even a flare's going to save you there. You just yeah. have to dodge the things. Yeah, yeah, like a boss. <laughs> but most of them, I mean, uh, uh, um, uh, shoulder-mounted guided rocket. Apparently, in in these regions, can cost us five thousand US dollars. Wow, that's bugger all. Yeah, that's not cool. No. All right, we have apple seeds and cancer. This is what the government has been hiding from us for years. So they have uh, many people freak out the mention of eating eating apple seeds, cherry pits, or apricot seeds, as they contain cyanide. New research, however, suggests that those seeds may be a cancer cure in waiting. False. <laughs> yes. I'm not, not even going to put a... Yeah, that's false. Um, but look, look let's, let's just be clear here. I know that, um, the, I know that uh, this website, uh, yourotherperspective.com <laughs> or YOP, uh, is, is, is renowned for giving clear, concise and reputable research. That is sarcasm. Uh, to the world, but in this instance, I'm going to say false. Yeah. Uh, so that actually is false and false and false. It's not actually new so-called research. Um, they, this has been this uh, amygdalin or late trial, which is a um, slightly modified version of amygdalin, uh, where they take because amygdalin has two sugar molecules on top of it, and late trial has one sugar molecule on top of it. Um. What's a sugar molecule between friends, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, they both cause they both get metabolized to cyanide anyway, and um, that can kill you. We actually went through this uh, the last episode about a guy who ate forty apricot seeds because he thought that they were. He bought them from a health food store, and he thought, ah, you know, I bought them from this health food store. They can't be that bad, and uh, he ended up having to call poison control and go to hospital to be treated for cyanide poisoning. Wow. But the reason I the reason why I brought this one up is that uh, when I went to do the write up after bringing this up in the last episode, I found some rather disturbing stories uh, revolving around this. Uh, let's go here. 
so late trial intoxication reported reports of a fatal case this was actually a guy uh who was taking this supplement uh which is being sold as late trial um and they sell it as a cancer cure or a cancer treatment and he thought it was just a supplement so he had it lying around his house he didn't treat it like dangerous medication and as such his 11 month old girl got her hands on it and ate it and he thought what's the harm it's uh it's just a vitamin because they call it vitamin b17 which is false as well and his 11 month old girl died from cyanide poisoning Jesus. He had no idea this stuff was even toxic because they don't tell you it's toxic. They say it's a cancer cure. It's perfectly safe because it's a vitamin. Well, well, it's look, it's not it's not like natural medicine purveyors to give um you know false or misleading uh information about the strength or toxicity of an item of a uh, of a compound. It's not like them to do that. That's unfortunate that in this one specific case that that had, had happened. One specific case. Well, there is also another case of a four-year-old child who had cancer. Okay, and was two told, specific cases. Well, the four-year-old didn't die, but this is a cancer patient who wasn't actually being given conventional chemotherapy. So this person was also not being treated for cancer because, again, this stuff does nothing to treat cancer. They have researched this over and over and over again Strong scientific consensus that this stuff does nothing to treat cancer unless it kills you because once you're dead, the cancer also stops growing. So 100% effective when you're dead. <laughs> yes. Um, but this four-year-old child also was taken to hospital with cyanide poisoning because they were being fed apricot seeds to treat their... Uh, multiple cases of cyanide poisoning in apricot kernels from children from Gaza... This, thankfully, wasn't a case of being sold a supplement or being told that um, being told that they were curing cancer. This is just a case of um, children being fed cakes, which were made with apricot kernels. 16 children eaten the kernels, 13 children recovered, two died shortly after admission, and a third child died two hours later. Wow, so, that's, that's intense. Yep. Who makes their cake with, with apricot kernels, though? Seriously. I know. And, an, some people. and finally, another case of a 40 year old woman who ingested apricot kernels presented at a food, health food store and became weak within 20 minutes. The patient was comatose and hypothermic on presentation, but responded promptly to antidotal therapy for cyanide poisoning because she had cyanide poisoning. Wow. After eating apricot kernels, which she bought at a health food store. Wow, that's 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 interesting that they would sell the kernels. Well, that's where the story wow. came up last week. A, a guy thought they were because he, this guy was allergic to nuts, and he bought these as an alternative to nuts. And he was walking down the street eating them, and his friend said, "Maybe you shouldn't be eating so many of those." And he said, "No, it's healthy." And then he he looked at the fine prints on it, and it said, "Warning: Do not eat more than two or three of these in one day, or ever." <laughs> I'm sure they Wow. But it it's just I I mean I, I I thought I'd bring this up because it came up last week, but then as I said when I went to do the write up on this, I found all of these cases and it it just it just pisses me off. Because they keep doing this and they keep selling it as if it's some kind of conspiracy. I mean if if you're selling snake oil or something that doesn't work, that's one thing. But to continue to sell something when you know it kills people and to say it's some kind of conspiracy theory that they say it kills people and sell it as a cancer cure and sell it to four-year-old children as a cancer cure yeah but you know in their defense they're not quite bright i don't know some of these people i mean joe mccullough is a doctor dr oz is a fairly talented heart surgeon from what i hear i mean some of these people they do know better 
Yeah, and you know what? I, I completely retract my statement. That's uh, it's ridiculous for me to have uh, insinuated that the, um, the the claims made by people correlate directly to uh, a low intelligence. But <laughs> I got to say, it, well, no, no, no. I was actually being sincere there, even though it did come out funny. Um, I uh, <laughs> I did. Um, uh, I, I you know, it is one of those things though that they it is just so disingenuous of of people who should know better um, saying things that uh, like the. The Garcinia Cambogia um, that was, you know, pimped by Dr. Oz previously and uh, other doctors uh, in, in addition to obviously naturopaths. Here, here's, here is, a, here is a, um, a statement. Here is a truism. You know, if, if the drug that you are pimping is also pimped by naturopaths, there's a good chance, there's a good chance that it's not going to do anything or is, you know, potentially going to be harmful. You know, look. They don't call it natural medicine for for you know, sorry they they call medicine medicine for a reason because it's actual medicine. When you add other you know names to it like natural medicine, all you're doing is diluting, which is interesting, of course, because the whole homeopathy. Um, anyway, it's it's just it's it's one of those interesting things that uh, you you know look just trust your doctor, um, but not Doctor Oz <laughs> or, or any of those people on the show, the doctors. Uh, yeah, or any anyone who's ever associated with Andrew Wakefield. And if anyone wants to know why I said that, go yeah. back to the Andrew Wakefield episode I did, episode number five, where I went into why he's not only a bad doctor, but a genuine scam artist and probably the biggest mass murderer of children in existence. Wow. Okay, that could be it's liability. A- I don't know. Could be liability. <laughs> Look, if, hey. I will say effectively, effectively, because he has scared people away from vaccines and now I think every every child that dies from now on from a disease that was brought to the brink of extinction and was brought back from the brink of extinction because of uh, the anti-vaccine movement, we could probably point to Andrew Wakefield and say, this one's on you. Yep. Or the CIA. Also the CIA. Right. I'm only saying that because of that specific instance where uh, while the CIA was, uh, you know, uh, looking for um, Osama bin Laden, they set up a vaccine um, uh, distrib- distribution centre in Afghanistan. And, um, <laughs> and uh, you know, while they did find Osama bin Laden, they may have also scared a lot of people off um, vaccines in that area. Thanks, guys. <laughs> so great when they go into the Middle East. They always fix everything. Yeah. No, they always fix everything with every country that they go into. Okay, next story. We'll move on from that. They opened the first restaurant of human meat in the world. So a restaurant in Japan is selling human meat. Obviously by people who volunteer to have their meat sold. So it offers its customers a varied menu where prices may range from 100 up to 1,000 euros. This is obviously a European website. Steam it. The most expensive dish would be 11.93 US dollars. Wow. Uh, I'm going to say that this is uh, false. I'm going to say that this is uh, false um, on the basis that in most countries cannibalism is illegal – uh, and also, uh, look, um, Japan has already got so, so very much whale meat. Why bother <laughs> with the uh, trade of human meat? Well, when they go around ramming the, uh, the Greenpeace boats that are in their way, I mean, they've got to do something with those bodies, right? And they don't come true. back with whale true, meat. that's true. That's true. I retract my comment. <laughs> uh, but no, this is false. Uh, actually, now I'll, I'll point straight to Snopes to this one. Um, this actually came from a, an April Fool's article, but the April Fool's article was actually not in English. It was in Spanish, in a satirical Spanish publication. So you probably can't find the original spoof article, but yeah, it was an April Fool's article. Those damn Spaniards... 
uh, just constantly degrading the, uh, the the Japanese psyche with their fake news articles. It's ridiculous. And the, the, the Japanese uh, delicacy food market. Yes, the other, other white meat. Mm. Right, and moving on to the next one. Ah, oh, the doctors. So this one... Um, this one isn't so much uh, uh, true or false. It was just something um, I found rather amusing because we all, we've, have you, do you know of the show The Doctors? I do, I do. I referenced it uh, two answers ago. Oh, did you? I did when I said uh, don't trust anything that uh, Dr. Oz says or any other doctors on The Doctors show. Oh, right, all oh, right. Um, yeah, so the... The original, he actually left, the original producer of, of The Doctors, um, Del Beatry, actually uh, d- produced the vaxxed so-called documentary, which was directed ah, by Andrew Wakefield. Yes. Um, but I just found this amusing. So they, uh, this was actually in a story on, on Poppy T. And they were talking about the opioids, which are found in, in poppies. Um, now, these are supposed to be doctors, like qualified doctors. So have a listen to what this one person, this qualified doctor says about opiates. And they're brewing this tea that has the same opioid, heroin, morphine effect that's a hallucinogen. But in this case, because you just don't know how much you're getting with the tea, he, he actually overdosed. A college he student uh, living in a frat house. So this- now... I don't know how much you know about opioids or the effect of opioids, but I don't know if they're a hallucinogen. Not, they're not, that's not one of their known properties or one of their, uh, well, I don't know. I don't know, actually. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not a hallucinogen. And I just found this troubling from these people who are supposed doctors. Where, where are these people getting their medical degrees from? To me, that is a very basic thing to know when you are a medical doctor. Hmm. Probably not something that they should be saying on air then when those words can come back to bite them. Yeah. Mind you, most people watching uh, the show The Doctors are unlikely to have medical degrees. I'm just making an assumption there. I apologise for that. <laughs> uh, broad sweeping assumption. But, uh, but, it, but uh, you know, maybe she's probably fairly uh, unlikely to be called on such, um, you know, blatant uh, misrepresentations of fact. Well, sorry, I blew that one. Yeah. Yeah, you ruined it. I've ruined it for her. Well, I have zero regrets. <laughs> okay, so an anti-vaccine group, actually two anti-vaccine groups, funded a study on... Um, oh, look, I've, I've probably ruined that already. Just ignore that. So, yeah, two anti-vaccine groups funded a study on um, to prove that vaccines cause autism. How do you think that worked out for them? Uh, it was found to be false. Were they both found to be false? Uh, was it also found to be disingenuous because genuine, generally you don't want to have any sort of uh, perceptions of, uh, of conflicts of interest uh, when you know you set an agenda and say go out here have some money go out and find links between uh, you know uh, the thing that we are trying to represent and um, the 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 thing that we're trying to correlate that with go out and find that here's some money go and do it. Um, yeah, so I'm going to say false on both accounts. Well, look, this the study did happen, um, but the and that the the conflicts of interest were declared. So if you look down the bottom of the study, oh, that's good. Uh, it does say who funded the study, and there's two anti-vaccine groups in there. However, the study found no that vaccines don't actually cause autism. Well, specifically, the study was on thimerosal causing vaccines because they don't even know what they're claiming anymore. I mean, going back to Andrew Wakefield's original claim that it was the uh, specifically the MMR vaccine, it was the live attenuated measles virus that was causing infections in the gut, which was further causing autism. And now they're saying that no, it's the thimerosal which is causing vac- which is causing autism. Which Andrew Wakefield will not um, he he will not dispute that claim. But he also won't say it. He just won't dispute it. Um, this is all, you know, they, they all sit around and pretend they agree with each other, but they're all saying conflicting things. But they and don't. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, 
because it's been a little bit since I've looked into this topic, but um, from memory, thimerosal isn't used that widely, or thimerosal or ethyl mercury isn't used that widely in uh, vaccines too much anymore. It's a preservative, so it's used uh, primarily in vaccines that are likely to sit for a while on on vaccine shelves while they're while they're awaiting uh, the people that uh, you know that, that uh, need their vaccinations. So uh, not use that. Uh, that that much in the West. Um, I, I recall that it was being used quite a bit in vaccinations or ampules sent to uh, Africa uh, and India, but uh, I don't believe that they were that that or that that additive was all that re- uh, prevalent in um, in vaccine ampules sent to you know the the Western world. They used to be, um, but because of public outcry and they did a risk assessment and they said fine we'll, we'll take it out so there's no reason there's actually no reason that they took it out other than public perception there's no, there's no scientific reason why they did that but you are correct they don't use thimerosal in any pediatric vaccines anymore uh, and even um, it's, it's even fairly rare in vaccines for older people so adults and older children I think Maybe the flu vaccine has it, but uh, certainly not any of the pediatric vaccines. They don't have it, which affects their shelf life. You know, it's it's not a, it's actually a, a bad thing. Wow, yeah, that's interesting. Administration of thimerosal causing administration of thimerosal containing vaccines to infant rhesus macaws does not result in autism like behavior or neuropathology. They actually um, started off with a a trial version of this um, before the, the groups did the full funding for it. And they did actually initially find aberrant behavior in the, uh, in the, in the vaccinated macaws. So the, the group said, okay, cool, we'll fully fund this. So, you know, there's, there's, a, um, there's indication of an agenda right there where they, they weren't actually going to fully fund it until it started to go their way. But uh, now what they eventually found when they broadened the study and introduced more animals into the study and did a, a longer-term study, that it was just a group of cantankerous little shits. <laughs> also, you said macaws. It's macaques. Macaques. Yeah, macaws are the birds, isn't it? Macaws are the birds. Macaques are the monkeys. Macaques, or yeah. apes. I don't know. One of those. They're monkeys. Macaques, yes. I don't know why I said macaws. It was right there in front of me. Acknowledgements. Uh, the Ted Lindsay Foundation, which I looked into them, that they're, they're a you know a foundation which was started because someone's kid had autism, so they put money into autism research. The, I didn't find any anti-vaccine stuff on their site, which doesn't mean that they're not anti-vax. I just couldn't find any. Uh, however, Safe Minds and National Autism Association definitely, uh, definitely anti-vax. And the Johnson and Vernick families I didn't look into. Wow. Yeah. Well, you know, that's what you get from PNAS. <laughs> okay, here is... <laughs> this, this is one of my favourites. There's a picture of a guy holding what I initially thought was um, Doctor Who fandom gone a little bit wild. It's a butt plug that looks like a sonic screwdriver. It doesn't look like a sonic screwdriver at all. It doesn't? I thought it did. It's got the little... No, I- I, 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 have an, I have a sonic screwdriver tattooed on my arm. I have two sonic screwdrivers, two sonic screwdrivers and a sonic spork next to me. I can assure you it does not look like a sonic screwdriver. All right. So I was wrong. However. <laughs> it looks like a Dalek though. <laughs> it does. Yes. So, um, yeah, so apparently the, the, the caption says, that one time I went to a mortuary and some cute mortician girls gave me a butt plug. Seriously, this is to prevent post-mortem linkage. Personally, I find it somewhat satisfying to know that every homophobe who was buried in the last few decades is spending eternity with a butt plug firmly screwed in their ass. I mean, literally. Look at this. Got some threads on it. So is this a device that everyone who is buried has sticking in their orifices? I'm going to say maybe. Uh, well, 
I surely there there must you know this is something that I've never considered. Um, but there has to be somewhere you know because the the pressure that builds up post mortem um, from uh, you know essentially uh, your own digestion stops, but everything inside you starts digesting you. So the the pressure, the gases, etc., they got to have somewhere to go. I'm going to say that while this may not be true, that there must be some amount of truth to it. I have a friend who's a post mortem examiner, and also. Um also a mortician I mean she kind of like, uh, flicks between the two things but she she deals with dead people so I very excitedly rushed to Facebook and sent her a message and said is this true and she came back with a firm yes it's called an anal vaginal plug or an AV plug and this is inserted into the orifices of people who are buried to prevent leakage wow wow the more well, you, you know go. that's that's quite interesting <laughs> and then I, I also am quite amused at thinking all of the uh, the homophobes who are buried with butt plugs fir- screwed firmly into their rectums. If only they were alive to enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, they should. Um, they should. Uh, they should bring them to them and say, "Look, you're on on death's door. Uh, we know you're going to die. Do you have any preference?" Yeah. Do you want it in pink? <laughs> or black, or no, no. Ah, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I'm not for torturing people, but you know, part of especially on their way out. But yeah, no, I know. There's a bit of poetic justice. Part, part there. of me likes to to dream. You know, I like to daydream sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this one has been going gangbusters recently, and I recent I also heard it's on. Um, Skeptics Guide to the Universe, so there's some actual, I'm not being sarcastic, that's actually a, um, a tick in, in the box. Scientists have found proof that dogs really are smarter than cats. Hmm. I, I, look, I, look this, this website, rebelcircus.com, it, as I said earlier, look, it's, it's uh, usually a very reputable, I'm going to have to say false. <laughs> Uh, measures of intelligence between species. I'm just not. I'm not sure that that is a viable. Um, like, what sort of methodology would you use? Oh, it's, it's not. It's not just Rebel Circus. It's it's actually a whole bunch of other 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 um, websites as well. I I just picked that one. It, it just sort of popped up first thing on Google. But there are a lot of websites that that um, dedicate that have themselves to. <laughs> uh, proving that one one species of animal is uh, is is smarter than the other species of animal. Look, I, I'm going to say that this is false. I mean, objectively, how would you measure that? I, I know you know the, they they look to measure intelligence in in rats by uh, putting them in a maze. But could you do the same for two different types of uh, animals? And uh, you know, how would you how would you account for how would you adjust for uh, their innate um, skills? I just I don't know that this would that any such study would be possible. I, I like the way I'm gonna say false. I'm I like, say false. I like the way you're thinking with this one. So this actually comes out from a, um, a currently unpublished study. So it's only been approved. This is this is how much people, how uh, obsessed people are with this topic. This is this was approved late November, and the uh, the the abstract has been published, but the actual article hasn't been published yet. So. Oh look, here it is now. It's just been published. I literally yesterday I looked at this, and it hadn't been published yet, so I couldn't actually read it. But now it has, so uh, I'm gonna have to read through it. But um, <laughs> so the the article is called "Dogs Have the Most Neurons, Though Not the Largest Brain." Trade off between body mass and number of neurons in the cerebral cortex of large carnivorean species so they actually what they did was they took a whole bunch of carnivores and they didn't have to be a blade carnivores obligate carnivores sorry like um, dogs who are mostly carnivores but are also omnivorous uh but they they studied the brains they counted neurons in the brains of, of various different carnivores so what they found was that um dogs have the highest number of, of carnivores or the high, sort of the highest dogs have the highest number of neurons 
or the, the highest neuron density. Uh, and then once the, the animals start to get larger, the neuron density starts to, to drop down. So when they counted these, and, and sticking to the cats and dogs, um, they found that cats have, no, sorry, cats have 280,000 neurons, dogs have 500,000. Yeah, cats, cats 280, roughly 3,000, and dogs have 500,000 neurons. So cats have less neurons than dogs, and, it, and that works on the does general that, assumption. Does that directly translate to intelligence, though? Uh, so what the way that they're generally yes, and I I tried to find the the articles that that link that um link the the neuron count to intelligence, and I I couldn't find anything that really convinced me, but it's just generally assumed. Um, but the thing with with dogs. And cats is dogs are social animals, and social animals tend to have more neurons because dealing with other creatures is a puzzle in itself. I mean, we're all humans; we understand that. Uh, so when they're interacting with our other animals, they kind of have to work out what the other other animals are doing, which takes up more more energy. Whereas cats are solitary animals, so they don't have to deal with the complexities of being social. Now. When you directly measure the intelligence, things get a little bit more complicated because as humans, we tend to measure intelligence based on a social animal. So we, we say we train a dog to do things, the dog does things, the dogs interact with us more, whereas cats tend not to interact with us so well and therefore... Also they're dicks. Well, actually, that's... that's um, one guy uh, who was studying this, there's a really good article uh, on messybeast.com. Uh, it's, it's very well referenced, so I'd encourage anyone who wants to, to look at um, the intelligence of cats to look at it. And in that article, they actually, uh, one guy actually said that um, it's easier to work with fish than it is to work with cats. Because <laughs> cats, cats are totally non-cooperative. As you said, cats are dicks. But what, what they did find is, is cats are actually very good at, um, at uh, figuring, at, at problem solving. They just have a different way of problem solving. So you look at rats in a maze or dogs in a maze. They will find their way through the maze to find the treat at the end of the maze and they're very good at it. Whereas a cat will go through the maze, look in little dark corners and then start grooming itself. Um, now grooming... In cats, grooming is like a placeholder behavior. You know when you play the, when you used to play the old um, platform computer games, and if you left the character sit there long enough, it would start fidgeting or, or tapping its foot, or you know, banging on the screen, sort of saying, "What are you doing?" That's what the cats do. When the cats aren't sure what to do, they start grooming themselves. And the the looking in dark corners is because they're ambush predators. They look in. They're always looking in dark corners. Um, to see if there, there just happens to be something there that they're interested in. So the rats and dogs are more goal-oriented, whereas cats are more leave no stone unturned. Wow, that's really interesting. Also, when you were referencing used to playing platform games, uh, that's not a used to thing for me, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I still play pa- platform games, but not many people do anymore. It's all first-person no. shooters. Uh, cats are also good at um, they're also good at manipulating things. They actually they found um, evidence of cats using tools. Uh, they all they can learn by observation. So they watch you open a fridge. They learn just by a pure observation that the food is in the fridge. So if they open can open the fridge, um, they can get to the food. And anyone who has a um, a latch like the, the door handles that you move up and down would know that cats can figure those out as well, and they, they do that by observation. Uh, they can st- if they stick a cat in a box where... Which the- I highly encourage, by the way. <laughs> you stick a cat in a box with, with um, some strings or things that they have to manipulate to open the box, they can actually figure that out. And 
they found that with cats, they, they kind of tend to click. Once they figure something out, they figure it out for good, um, which is not good if you have a cat carrier box because once they work out, and as I said, they can do this by observation, that there's a little latch that allows the box to open. Once they work that out, it's actually very hard to even get another box to put them in because then they start looking for the latch that opens the box. Yep, uh, too smart for their own good. Strangely enough... They can't learn by innate behavior. So if you rig up a box or you have a system where if the cat starts grooming itself, the box opens, it can't actually work that out. Oh, well. Because it's not something that the cat has actually done. Can directly influence. Yeah. Or has directly influenced. Yeah, well, that's mm. interesting. So, yeah, essentially when you, when, you, when you work on the cat's level and you, you take into consideration that they are... Um, ambush hunters, they're also, uh, oh God, there goes my vocabulary again. We'll yeah. start swearing. <laughs> you know, when you, you look for opportunistic, they're, they're opportunistic yep. hunters, they're ambush predators. So when you take that into consideration, when you, you work out their intelligence test, when you try and test their intelligence, you, you take into account that they're not social animals. Um, they tend to manipulate people. Also, Do I don't know. Ever- I don't know if you've heard that um, cats only meow at people. I didn't know that. It's a. Uh, it's something. What are that they, they doing when they're in heat? Then they yell. Well, that's a mating call. But the the, the meowing is a general communication. Uh, it's something that they do when they're kittens. So they, but they they grow out of it. So they don't meow to each other. But again, they're learning by observation that humans communicate by vocalizations. So they do that to communicate to people. Wow, that's fascinating. So again, this is, this is um, in, intelligence. Also, when given, uh, comparing, going back to comparing cats to dogs, when given problems, uh, a, a puzzle to solve, cats will obsessively try to solve the puzzle until they get bored, and then they'll just start cleaning themselves and go and find something else. Um, but... Where a cat will obsess over solving a puzzle, a dog will give up and look to the human and say, help. And that, that sort of mm. where the dogs have that intelligence and why dogs have the higher number of neurons is because they're social animals. They understand the complexities of, of social and they know how to look to people and say, can you help? Well, that's uh, interesting. Which also they found that dogs can, can learn. If you point at something, the dog knows you're pointing at something. Yes, and unless unless you have a dumb dog, <laughs> which some do. Yeah, uh, cats. Cat. Both cats and dogs have object permanence. What does that mean? So that means that if you have something, so you put an object in front of an animal, and then you hide the the, the object, the animal still knows that it, it it doesn't cease to exist because it can't see it. Ah, so you can't do the whole peekaboo trick that you do with babies. No. Where'd he go? Although, strangely, um, there's also an orientation um, thing with cats. Cats have, unsurprisingly, an egocentric system of orientation. So the world, re- the world revolves around them. It's actually kind of hard to yep. explain. I'd encourage people to look at this. No, no, no. Any, anybody who knows anything about cats <laughs> knows that uh, that is absolutely the way that cats operate. So they, they did an experiment where they have... You exist for me, okay? So they, if you have three... Say, say you've got a, um, three cups and you put a treat under a cup and the cat can... can if the cat knows the treat's under the cup, it, it knows to go for it. If you put a screen up so the cat can't see the cup and then you move the cups but not move the treat, so... Say the treat's in the middle, and then you move the whole set to the right, so now the treat is in the far left-hand cup. The cat will find the treat because, it's, because of its egocentric orientation. It knows that, that that treat was in that spot in reference to itself. But if you move them all to the right and keep the treat in the middle cup, so now the middle cup is further to the right, the cat can't find it, or it, it chooses the wrong cup. Stupid cat. <laughs> but if it, because it has object permanence, if, you, if it can see the cup move around, it, it actually will 
um, find the treat. Yeah, well, that's really quite interesting. You don't think it uh, it has uh, anything to do with? Well, I suppose yeah. If you remove the uh, the visual sensation, uh, I was going to say uh, if you've touched the thing, they could at least smell that um, the the ball under the under the cup. But uh, I suppose if you if they're still unable to do that when you remove, or if they're unable to do that when you remove um, sight, then that that suggests that uh, it's it is it is that. How about that? That's really quite interesting. I thought, and another thing, they also have very they um, have great temporal um, awareness. So if, if you they they're very good at timing things. If you stick a cat in a box and then put a treat in a certain place, depending on how much time it's been in the box, they initially did the experiment with five seconds versus twenty seconds. So the cat knew it was in the box for five seconds, or the, it was in the box for twenty seconds. Um, they they managed to reduce that down to five and eight seconds, and they were still able to distinguish how long they'd been in the box for. Oh wow, that's really quite interesting too. It's it's all yeah. so basically the the moral of that entire spiel is that um yeah, once when dogs have more neurons than cats, they have a higher neuron density than can the cats. They have a higher brain mass to body mass ratio than cats, but a lot of that goes into their social awareness, which makes them better companions for people I mean, if, if any of the dog people out there uh, because they are better able to interact with us, they're more social animals. But when you get down on, on their level um, and, and problem solving, I, you know, cats have their advantages. They have their own level of intelligence. They work on their own terms. Um, and I, I, I would say that to say dogs are smarter than cats, I think is... A long bow to draw. It is, yeah. It, it's it's a complex situation, and um, you know, we we get along better with dogs. I, I'd say it was probably the we we are able to more easily measure the intelligence of dogs because we have the same kind of intelligence as dogs. Um, is that directed specifically at me? Uh, God, let me think about that one for a while. <laughs> Anyway, uh, that is all of the little stories that I have for today. I'll have to get you in for a proper episode one day. Um, but anyway, uh, where can we find you? Uh, well, uh, pretty easily. Facebook, Twitter, Jake Farwarden. Um, you can also uh, go to patreon.com forward slash ifriends. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash letter I and the word friends. Don't put your literal I in the address bar. It's unsanitary. It'll hurt your eye. You'll end up with pink eye because, you know, poo particles floating all around all the time. Um, but anyway, that's pretty well the best place to find me. Patreon.com forward slash ifriends. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you very much for coming on and uh, spending the last hour bantering about yeah, course, crap that fun. you find online. Of course, of course, any time. Very happy to do it. And uh, likewise, uh, I'll, I'll have you on. Um, I'll have you on iFriends uh, as soon as possible. That would be fantastic. It would be a very fun experience, I believe. Hell yeah! Let's do it. Well, that just about does it for this episode. But first, I'd like to thank Jude for becoming a patron at patreon.com slash the bunk. And remember, every pledge goes towards the $400 goal that helps ensure the long-term viability of this show and a weekly release schedule. If you'd like to make a one-off donation, you can do so at thebunk.com.au and click on the PayPal link. While you're there, check out the show notes for links, citations, and corrections. Also, leave a comment and make a suggestion for a subject for the next episode. If you'd like to help out but can't afford a donation... Share the show on Twitter and Facebook or any other social media that you use. And while you're on the Facebook and Twitter, follow the show. And that does it. I will say goodbye and leave you to the music. Hello, Jake. I, uh, you know, I, I hesitated in answering because of the um, the Skype tune. I love the Skype tune. So much. <laughs> do 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 do. Ah.
Oh, we both get the do, same do, one on the same end too. Do, do. <laughs> I just want to beatbox to it. It's great. Oh, you're a musician, aren't you? Oh, uh, double. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've got all the gear. Should do Me something. Too. Oh, yeah, we should totally get together and do a... Do, do, do. <laughs> do, do, do. Do, do, do. Do, do. <laughs> yeah, I'm in. Let's do it. Awesome. Be professionals. All right. <laughs> I'm standing up. In front of the camera, in all of my nakedness, let me tell you about the birds and the bats.